Howdy. This video is on acid-base titrations. Titrations are used to accurately determine the concentration of a solute in solution. There are many different types of titrations, types of titrations, acid-base, electrochemical, based, some are based on solubility. Acid-base titrations are probably the most common. What you should be able to do after watching today's video is, is be able to identify what a titration is used for, identify the reactions that are considered to go to completion. For a titration, all titrations have to base, be based on reactions that are considered to go to completion, that have very large equilibrium constants. You should be able to draw a plot of the pH as a function of titrant added for four different types of acid-based titrations. You should be able to calculate the pH at different points of a titration curve. So titrations are used to quantity to determine the concentration of a compound. And so the reactant with a known concentration goes in the burette. The sample with an unknown concentration goes in the flask. By measuring how much of the titrant, the stuff in burette, you have to add to completely react with the analyte, you can determine what must be, have been the concentration of the analyte. Quantitative addition of a solution of known concentration to one of unknown concentration, resulting in a chemical reaction is called titration. Acid-based titrations are among the most common when a standard sodium hydroxide solution is added to a hydrochloric acid solution. The neutralization reaction occurs. A pH meter is employed to measure the acidity of the solution. To illustrate, let's add 0.100 molar base to precisely 50 milliliters of a 0.100 molar acid solution. The pH increases slowly at first. As the amount of base added approaches that required for complete neutralization, that is the stoichiometrically equivalent amount, the pH begins to increase more rapidly. The last few drops of added base change the pH from about 3 to 7. The pH is 7 when precisely 50 milliliters of base have been added. We are then at the equivalence point, or end point, at which the stoichiometric amount of base required to neutralize the acid has been added. Addition of one drop of NaOH beyond that needed to neutralize the acid causes the pH to increase from 7 to about 10. Thus, the endpoint of the titration can be determined with high precision. With high precision. And so a couple things. For an acid-base titration, you can determine the equivalence point using either a pH meter or using an acid-base indicator. Um, the equivalence point corresponds to when the moles of the titrant added is equal to the moles of the analyte current um, in the solution initially. And solution with a known concentration is put in the burette and solution of known, unknown concentration is in the flask. And so we measure initially what is the initial volume in the burette. We add it slowly, dropwise, until we've reached the equivalence point. Again, determined by either using a pH meter or using an acid to base indicator. And then you stop and measuring the difference between initial and the final, that tells us what was the volume of the titrant added to the, to the um, solution. Now, when you get close to the equivalence point, you have to be very careful and you have to go dropwise um, one drop at a time. You should also use a stir bar so to make sure that the color of the indicator stays present. Sometimes what will happen is you'll put a drop in and you'll see the color of the indicator. And then if you swirl it, you'll see that it actually goes away because the solution isn't completely uniform. It actually takes a little bit of a while. So always use the indicator and, and close to the equivalence point, you have to go one drop at a time. And then you want to see as light, if in this case is actually phenolphthalein is being used as an indicator. And so you want to just see a light pink color. Whenever you see a pink color, it means you've reached the equivalence point. Um, one drop to reach that pink color as long as it's persistent, but it is very, very um, sensitive. Here a sodium hydroxide solution, whose concentration is accurately known, is being added to a burette before titrating an acid of unknown concentration. The volume of sodium hydroxide solution in the burette is estimated to two decimal places. The sodium hydroxide solution is added slowly to a solution of the unknown acid in a flask. The acid solution also contains an indicator whose color will change to pink when the acid has been consumed. As the acid begins to be depleted, some color change is briefly visible.
The equivalence point in the titration has been reached when the last drop of sodium hydroxide solution turns the indicator to a pink color that does not fade with time. The volume of sodium hydroxide solution in the burette at the end of the titration is estimated to two decimal places. Now we know the volume of sodium hydroxide solution used in the titration and can calculate the number of moles of acid that were in the flask. And so when you're using burettes, please remember always go two decimal places. So you have to estimate the distance, the meniscuses between the lines. And that's also true if you like using a, a ruler. And so in this case, we had initial burette reading of 0 0.50 mils. The final reading was 23.90 mils. And so that means it took 23.40 mils of sodium hydroxide to react with all the HCl initially present. Now, if the concentration of sodium hydroxide was 1.00 molar, um, and the concentration of H and the sorry volume of the HCl was initially 50 milliliters, what was the initial concentration of the HCl? And so, at the equivalence point, it's important to remember that the moles of the titrant added equals the moles of the analyte, as long as your stoichiometry is one to one, as in this case. So, moles of sodium hydroxide added equal moles of HCl initially in the flask. Now, moles is just going to be volume times concentration. And so we found our sodium hydroxide was one molar, capital M is molar, and we had we added 23.4 milliliters. We moved the decimal over three and it gives you 0 0.0234 liters is the 23.4 liters. And so the liters times molar gives us the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. We know that one because we know the sodium hydroxide concentration very well. Now we know the volume of the HCl initially, it's 50 milliliters or 0 0.05 liters, and we're looking for the concentration of HCl. Now if we take that top e um, equation and we divide both sides by the 0 0.05, that gives us the concentration of HCl as being 0.468. So again, titrations are used just to determine what is the concentration of the analyte. Now, it's important that for titrations, the ECM constants are very, very large. Now, sometimes it's hard to determine the ECM constant for a reaction. Sometimes what you have to do is be able to determine the, what's called as net ionic equation. And so you have to be able to identify the spectator ions. Now, if we look at the reaction that we're using for that titration, sodium hydroxide plus HCl going to water plus sodium chloride, you have to remember that sodium hydroxide is a strong base. And so if I have a bottle labeled one molar sodium hydroxide, I actually have a bottle with one molar sodium ions and one molar hydroxide ions. And so, do, so sodium hydroxide aqueous means sodium ions aqueous and hydroxide ions aqueous. HCl is a strong acid. It completely disassociates. So I have one bottle, one molar so, um, HCl means I have one molar hydrogen ions and one molar chloride ions. And so when I see HCl aqueous, I know it's hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Now I cannot do the same thing with a weak acid. A weak acid is present mostly as the molecules and so I cannot break it up into ions. And then sodium chloride aqueous, whenever you see something ionic solid but aqueous, Again, it's going to be present as ions. So sodium chloride aqueous actually means sodium ions and chloride ions. Now if we plug in the ions for these compounds, we get this equation. Now notice that there is sodium on either side of the arrows and there's chloride ions on either side of the arrows. And so nothing's happening to them. We refer to them as spectator ions. Now, if we remove the spectator ions, we get what's referred to as a net ionic equation. Now for this reaction, the net ionic equation is gonna be hydroxide ion plus hydrogen ion goes to water. Now you should recognize that the ECM constant for this reaction is actually one over Kw. Kw at 25 degrees Celsius is 10 to the, the minus 14th. So one over Kw is actually equal to 10 to the 14th. And so the ECM constant for this reaction for the sodium chloride plus, sorry, sodium hydroxide plus HCl going to sodium chloride plus water is 10 to the 14th. It's very large. For all uh, titrations, that constant has to be very large. We want to be able to consider the reaction going to completion. Now, often when you're looking at these Eklund constants, to determine the Eklund constant for the reaction, it's often helpful to find the net ionic equation, then they can recognize it. And so for the strong acid weak base, HCl plus ammonia going to chloride ion plus ammonium ion. Now the chloride ion is going to be a spectator ion, so that leaves you hydrogen ion plus ammonia going to ammonium ion. And so you should recognize that as 1 over Ka for the ammonium ion. And you can get the Ka for ammonium ion for the Kb of ammonia. And so that gives you a constant 1.8 times 10 to the ninth.
HF plus sodium hydroxide, fluoride ion plus water plus sodium ions, the sodium for that bottom reaction is a specter ion that leaves you with HF plus OH minus goes to F minus plus water. That's one over KB of F minus, which you can get from the KA of HF. And so you see that is 6.3 times 10 to the 10th. So for all titrations, the Ekman constant has to be very large and often best to determine the Ekman constants by determining the net ionic equation. The Ekman constant for the net ionic equation is the same as the Ekman constant for the regular reaction. Now we can look at a titration of a strong bass strong acid using a strong base. And so initially you have just the strong acid in the flask and so the pH is very low. And then as you add um, strong base, you consume some of that strong acid and so your pH actually goes up. Now, once you've added enough of the strong base to completely react the strong acid, you should be just left with sodium chloride plus water. Again, the Ekman constant is very large, so you consider the reaction goes to completion. And so at the equivalence point, you'd have just the products, which would be sodium chloride plus water, and so that would be a pH of 7. Now, if we look at the titration of a weak acid and a strong base, um, say here the weak acid is HF. And so again, in the flask, initially you have just the weak acid, so the pH is low. And then as you add the strong base, the pH goes up. Now, once you've get into the equivalence point, you've added enough sodium hydroxide to completely react with your HF, then you should be left with the F minus and sodium ions. Sodium ions are neutral, so you don't worry about them. F minus is the conjugate base of weak acid, so it's going to be basic. And so the equivalence point is greater than seven. So notice that the equivalence point for the titration depends on the type of titration you're using. Strong acid, strong base, pH will be 7 at the equivalence point, but here weak acid, strong base, the pH will actually be greater than 7. And the way I always remember is think about, okay, what is in my flask at the equivalence point? In this case, I have F-, minus, which is the conjugate base of a weak acid, so it's going to be basic. Now, that's also kind of interesting. And so for this one, we could also use, say, the phenolphthalein would be a good choice for the indicator. Now, there's also what's referred to as the halfway point. And so it's halfway to the equivalence point. You've had it half enough to reach to the equivalence point. Near the halfway point, you have what's referred to as the buffer region because you have weak acid and conjugate base in that region. Now, at exactly the halfway point, you've added half enough sodium hydroxide to react with your HF. And so exactly at the halfway point, you should have equal concentrations of HF and F minus. And so the pH should be equal to the pKa. And so you can actually estimate the Ka of the weak acid by using the halfway point. And again, that's the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, pH equals pKa plus log base over acid. Now, another type of titration we can look at, strong acid, strong base. And so in this case, in the flask, we have the strong base. And so our pH starts very high. As we add acid, the pH goes down. It's very similar to the strong acid using a strong base. Now, at the equivalence point, you know, again, the Ekman constant is very large. So we're going to have mostly products at the equivalence point, which is sodium chloride and water, which should be neutral. So the pH should be 7 at the equivalence point for this um, titration. Litmus is a great choice for this titration because it changes color um, at the equivalence point. We could also look at titrating a weak base using a strong acid. And so for HCl, titrating using titrating ammonia using HCl, um, you form Cl- minus and ammonium ion. Now at the equivalence point, again, the reaction goes to completion, very large Ekman constant. We should have chloride ions, which is neutral, ammonium ion, which is weak acid or conjugate base, and so it's actually going to be acidic. And so notice that at the equivalence point, the pH is less than 7. For this titration, methyl orange would actually be a good choice. Now at the halfway point, where you've added half enough of the titrant to get to consume your analyte, um, you already have what's referred to as a buffer region because you have both the weak acid and the conjugate base. At exactly the halfway point, the concentration of the ammonia should be the same as the ammonium ion. And so log of 1 is 0. And so exactly at the halfway point, the pH should equal the pKa. And so it's four basic types of acid-base titrations. Notice that the titrant is always going to be a strong acid or a strong base because you always want the Ekman constant to be large. And so there's no reason not to go with the strong acid or a strong base. For an analyte, it could be a strong acid, weak acid, strong base, or weak, a weak base. It just depends what you're looking at. And so for a strong acid, weak base, the pH equals the pKa at the halfway point. 
for strong base weak acid, pH equals pKa. Again, we can use the henderson hasselbach At the halfway point, you've added half enough of the titrant to react with half of the analyte, and so you'll end up with, with equal quantities of weak acid and conjugate base. Titrating a weak base using a strong acid at the equivalence point, the pH should be less than seven. Titrating weak acid using a strong base, the pH should be greater than seven. And again, you can think about what's present in your flask at that point to help you determine the pH. Strong acid, strong base, the pH is actually going to be equal to seven at the equivalence point. And so remember, titrations are used to determine the concentration of allyl in solution. Um, you should be able to calculate the concentrations of all species, at, or you should be able to calculate the pH at any line in the curve. I hope that helped.